no natural limitation exists in esports other than RSI or something. And even RSI, most players are uh, playing through with pain, mm -hmm. pain medication or whatnot. But the psychological elements, like, we don't have that baseline yet. We don't have an established understanding of human psychology where we say, oh, that's the baseline. This is basically a broken rib here. He cannot play anymore. Okay, so he's injured now, right? That is not our understanding of the current uh, yeah. situation. And the, th the threat for Eastwood's players is so incredible. Like, the, th the issues we have in Overwatch with that, and it's honestly, like, the system, how it facilitates that issue and how it's getting worse next year, I'm scared. Yeah. I'm honestly I am scared. I I'm terrified. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Deep Dives into the Minds of Esports. My name is Blake Panashevitz, and today's guest is one of the more prolific writers related towards investigative journalism, really towards Overwatch, helping break stories like the GGEA story, as well as 222 Lock, which recently got announced and is now implemented. He is also the co-host of a show called Tactical Crouch. Please let me introduce my friend, Sasha Heinisch, maybe better known as Yes. Very good. Very, very well pronounced. I, I, I was nice. like, I, I almost got stuck in it and I was like, nope, you just got to go for it. Just got to <laughs> go for it. We have it. Uh, it was very close. So I'm excited to have you on the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, this should be exciting. People are going to get to like, like you've obviously done stuff with Volumail. I watched both of your uh, Dell Furthers with him um, in my mm -hmm. research for you, which if people are looking to also get to know you, get more, check those out. Like that's a very quick way to kind of know a, a good overview of his life. Um, so I like to start off the show fairly easy. Um, you, I would say that you're kind of an argumentative person. Sometimes you're very good at debating. I think that's a good thing. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you were going to law school at one point. Um, what type of lawyer could you have seen yourself be? So, considering I not, have not much interest in business, um, it would have either been uh, public defender, possibly, mm -hmm. um, or honestly, potentially politics, maybe. We, we had, my, my, uh, I mean, my group of friends had for a while this political inclination. Interestingly, I couldn't see myself standing for that particular political view now. But um, also, we were sort of like, I guess, counter to what usually happens. Usually people that go to school, go to college, they are more left-leaning than they will eventually be. Mm -hmm. We were very conservative in our views and then turned a little bit more in into the other direction. So, um, but yeah, that, I think those two fields would have been likely for me to go to, into because I honestly most of the time can't ca uh, get myself to care about business. Mm -hmm. I know there was one point that I was thinking about going to law school and I, the, uh, the only type of lawyer I think it could have ever been is a public defender. I don't think I could mm -hmm. have ever been like a prosecuting attorney. Um, like I, I, I like respect people who can do that, but I have a very, like I, I understand the concept of defending everyone until pro proven guilty. Like I understand that, but I don't understand like I need to prosecute everyone and let the law determine whether or not they're innocent or guilty. Yes. And the better I do, sometimes morally the wrong thing happens. Yeah. And that is, yeah, that's, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And whereas the defender side, I could always kind of justify in my head that if I do a really good job, then they need a better prosecutor. Like this is the law acting the way that the law is supposed to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's very interesting, though, that you went to law school. So I've had a few uh, German guests on my show. Um, I've had on Broy, uh, Nuki, mm -hmm. Promise, Amazing from League of Legends. Um, so your, your, your country is not that big. Um, so I, I'm imagining we're going to hit some similar, similar things. But where did you grow up in Germany? Um, I grew up in Western Germany in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia and there in the capital city, uh, Düsseldorf. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty, it's economically actually pretty strong, probably the strongest in the region. We are really tightly packed in West Germany. Like the, the, it's different cities, but just like the urban area is probably as densely populated as some of the big, biggest cities in the world, certainly mm -hmm. LA and whatnot, right? So, but in that area, Dusseldorf is probably the one that ranks the highest economically. Also, if you look at, um, 
at indexes recently in the last five years. It's consistently one of the top 10 cities in quality of life in the world. So I'm considering myself very fortunate to be living here. Um, it's not just because it's my hometown. I don't ha usually have any attachments to these types of things. It's just that this situation currently is honestly very good. Just mm -hmm. like education, things you could do. There's always a park near as there's nature pretty close. Um, and yeah, in, in general, also just getting around the city. I honestly think you don't need a car here, even though it's apparently the best car city in the world in terms of parking and uh, just um, roads and whatnot, uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, honestly, I consider myself very fortunate to be living here. Okay, so uh, you're obviously a little bit older for uh, like esports crowd. Uh, I think. I, I don't remember how old you are, but I know that you're older than me, and I feel old sometimes yeah. for the, the eSports yes. crowd. Okay, because yes. I'm 27. Um, am I 27? I'm 32, I think you're 27. Yeah. yeah. you're 32, so you got a few more years. Um, so, obviously, growing up in Germany... <laughs> in my life? <laughs> a few more years in my... <laughs> Honestly, no, you're not. Like, you got a few more years than me, right? Okay, yeah, okay. Five. You're I mean, you're not old. wrong either way. I know. Oh, I, you better not be dying anytime soon. That makes me terrified for my life. Um, I mean, is this honestly, you're not on that part of life yet, but statistically, once you turn 30, yeah. you're on the older part of people on the planet. It's, I think it's at somewhere at 29. Oh. And honestly, now birthdays don't matter anymore, I suppose. It's, <laughs> it's weird how we build this psychological event that somehow is meaningful, it's almost ritualistic. Mm -hmm. But the, the 30 honestly put me into a weird state, even though it, it, I intellectually fully understand that it's just an arbitrary number that works completely differently in other cultures, for instance, in Korea or whatnot. But just thinking in my, uh, through my 20s, 30, the perception people have towards you is very different. I think there's honestly a psychological difference between mm -hmm. someone telling me they, they are 29 or they're 30. And um, after that, every birthday is just really realistically the same. But 30 was, was considerable, I think. I, I, I try to think about it. So far, birthdays haven't meant a lot to me. Like, like after I turned 25, I think I just felt like sometimes I'll just forget, like, especially because I don't same, have like, yeah. any family that really celebrate with. Like, I'm not celebrating with family or anything really anymore um, or anything like that. Um, but you kind of bring up an interesting topic. And I, I kind of like to hear I, this like culture of like specializing one one day. We actually do it with a lot of things. Right. Like uh, United States obviously has like major historical events like the Fourth of July. We do it with like Christmas. We do it with like all these other things. Do you think that there's a reason that we do that? I think it's deeply needed that we have ritualistic events that bring. I mean, it's it's first and foremost, let's superficially say it's a reason to come together. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. But just to have it in a ritualistic way, honestly, through my 20s, I mean, it's, I, was, um, I was raised Christian, uh, mm -hmm. not strongly. It's really not that strong anymore um, in Germany, I would think. Uh, was Catholic. Then, um, yeah, I think about 15, you're done with all those rituals, so to say. Didn't really go to church after that. And... Um, it's um, then in my early 20s, during that time, you know, the, the four horsemen, so to speak, came up and I certainly was uh, an admirer of uh, Hitchens writing. And he pointed one thing out that always stuck with me and resonated so much in, in how I perceive just public structure, as in we can all talk about that there's no God and whatnot. But there are rituals that church has, the, co the, the community, the feeling of community, the coming together once on a Sunday, just to sit in church together, while also honestly almost meditating on what, uh, what has happened, to um, focus on that in quiet, at least that was the case in, in the Catholic church, and that as a ritual is missing in secular life nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like as a, I would not describe myself as a religious person because I don't subscribe to any religion in particular, 
but I would describe myself at my best when I'm involving spirituality into my daily life. Yeah. Meaning that I, during, yeah, I would say during my mid to late twenties, um, I guess we can talk about these things later, but there were occurrences in my life where I just said, okay, um, let's, let's try things and see how they work. Mm -hmm. The first thing that, that I realized is anything that works as a placebo, but still works, is not stupid. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, even one good argument, and I think it comes from black, black magic actually is think of people that, uh, use tarot cards. I don't personally, but some people do. It is of course not the case that these cars are somehow cosmically connected yeah. to the stars and can tell you what is happening. What these tarot cards might be able to do is give you a tool into your subconscious to actually think through your actions, your life, the people in your life. Mm -hmm. And as a tool, even if you are under the illusion that it uh, has some meaningful connection to the universe, it, it does connect you to something and that connection is uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. So um, I got through, I would say, Alan Watts, who's probably still the most influential uh, speaker, so to speak, in my life. Uh, I got heavily into Zen Buddhism and um, I would say it's to summarize what's under religious pretenses is probably you cannot, that, that's one of the biggest uh, criticisms towards him is that he doesn't keep any of those religions apart. He just tells you how his conception of the universe, how life is, mm -hmm. and he doesn't attach the label, okay, this is Anatra, uh, Anitta Buddhism and this is um, uh, Zen Buddhism and this is Hinduism. He doesn't care about these labels. He will just tell you uh, how, where these beliefs come from. And I honestly say, have to say I never really cared uh, categorizing them. But um, I definitely got a different self-conception self uh, mm -hmm. during that time. And just incorporating these almost, I would say, metaphysical beliefs about oneself into my daily life, which is hilarious to, to say, because, okay, under it, it, my underlying belief, when I say I and when I say my, it is fundamentally probably a lie. Mm -hmm. It's when I say I and my, I metaphysically honestly believe that I'm only referring to a location, not really a consistent self. Yeah. I think there's no... Or I, I definitely, and <laughs> I guess one would have to say, not through the means of drugs, but just through thought, I regularly get into po uh, positions where the self is gone. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I don't particularly uh, try. In these moments, I'm not uh, attached to anything. What I will say, though, is that this part of the universe that is sitting here is very argumentative, certainly has egoic attachments, certainly goes beyond what should be considered by someone that just has, you know, like this metaphysic belief slips out of these situations very frequently to, to interact with other people, also not graciously very often. <laughs> so, um, but I would say when I have time, to slip out because you cannot help but playing this game, right? Yeah. Like you cannot lay down and just not do it. You have to participate in the game, even though you under your underlying belief may be that it's really just the universe playing a beautiful game with itself, mm -hmm. right? Through us um, as sort of like little tools to understand how um, to just look at itself, really, right? So one of the things I guess I, I could open this box is um, during my 20s, I had two events happen where I would probably say my best friend at the time died very quickly uh, of leukemia mm -hmm. after um, already having survived Hodgkin lymphoma. And what oh. very frequently happens is that through the radiation therapy, there's a certain... Um, risk factor that people may get leukemia. Mm -hmm. Now he had survived Hodgkin lymphoma, was out of it probably for two years, I would say, 
maybe one and a half, was really finding himself back into life. And then it, it was honestly within a week, he was gone. Jesus Christ. And that was honestly, that was rough. But, um, and I also, during, I think it was beforehand, because I remember discussing this with him, I was also hit by a car on my bike. And I was acutely aware of my own mortality. Now, my friend dying really drove that home. It was honestly, <clears throat> somewhere around that time, I wrote a poem, which uh, uh, I called um, The Mind of M uh, Memento Mori, which is basically, I was constantly reminded of my own mortality. I would, the slightest bodily sensations would put me into panic attacks, would at least bring me to that impulse. And I, I just randomly stumbled onto Watts. And it made me realize that death was not as, and this is, this is probably not something you want to say to a suicidal person, for instance, but death is not that serious to me anymore, right? It's just, it is, it is pretty terrible when it happens too early to people, but I certainly had experiences in my life where when someone has lived a good life for long enough, where it is a relief. And I honestly also hate the way we, I think we have a pathological, neurotic relationship with death in Western culture, where we hate it so much. Yeah. We do every, we're now getting technology to try to prolong life potentially infinitely. Um, with a goal of uh, being immortal. Mm -hmm. And I think that is not understanding the game that I, I am playing. Mm -hmm. I think at some point I will realize that the universe will, through, will not be able to experience life through me in a fun way anymore. And then it's fi fine that I go. Mm -hmm. It's just... There's no reason to be so, to grasp at life the way I did, right? It's just like, I, like these, these uh, panic attacks I had because of, I mean, I looked into my family history, a lot of heart attacks, a lot of early heart attacks, especially in the males, uh, a lot of uh, strokes and whatnot. It's not worth getting attached to these thoughts yeah. and make the life you have really torture in anticipation of your eventual death that at this point we cannot prevent. Right. Yeah. So might as well have fun while doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. There's there's one uh, quote from Watts that um, that goes something like this: "Man suffers because he takes seriously what the gods have made for fun." So it is <laughs> it is honestly almost hypocritical, and I don't mind being hypocritical on this because mm -hmm. <laughs> another Watts quote: "You have no obligation to be." the person you were five minutes ago. If you have an honest belief and in the moment can substantiate it. I do have probably ingrained beliefs and underlying assumptions that I frequently put forth. For instance, mm -hmm. um, I honestly, there's something in me that strives to follow people who pursue excellence. Mm -hmm. This is not that I myself pursue it, even though I try. And I'm, it's not that I'm getting close, but there's a fascination and honestly power that I feel coming from people that are going for that. Now, this is completely counter to that metaphysical belief. These two things don't come. Like the, the one is, ah, and the other one is, right? Yeah. Cruising. Um, I sort of allowed myself to have that one off. It's, it's strange, right? It's uh, it, because everything in me is attracted to that source. And as such, it is really not, it's, it's not against my grain. That there's a Chinese philosophy of Wu Wei. Wu Wei is basically to live life with a grain, yeah. not against it. Mm -hmm. For instance, sailing is Wu Wei, right? Mm -hmm. Motorboating against the waves is not Wu Wei, mm -hmm. right? Do you know you and can actually sail against the wind, right? Like, yes, I'm true. Sorry yeah, about yeah. That. I yeah. owned a sailboat. I mean, you, 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 you do, do it in angles. You're not just yeah, like going yeah. like, okay, yeah. screw your winds. I'm just I going to. I can't remember what it's tacking. It's called tacking. Yeah. 
Yeah. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's generally what I do. I think okay. um, I also definitely probably would clarify or define myself as a fairly impulsive person that over the times have has applied techniques to sort of contain that beast. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's probably that's probably a good thing. Just the way like the because like there's different. You mentioned these games like the universe plays, but then there's games that society plays that you also are a part. Yes, of. like like there's tons of different games that like every day. There's games with your family that you're involved in, yes. right? If you want to look at it, there's games with, and so you have to kind of factor in like I'm I'm not just playing chess here. I'm playing like 4D weird ass chess yes. kind of going on right now. That you have to kind of take into consideration. One of the things I want to kind of look at though is like you're one of the smartest people that I personally now you might not think that um either that means i don't know very many people or <laughs> i've corrected the belief that you were pretty smart um i feel like i know quite a few intelligent people though so and i think that i would rank you as one you're at least able to like always look at new things and take in new ideas and you're always willing to learn um and i think that in itself kind of makes you a smart person where did you get that from has that been the person you've always been have you always str uh strove to learn new things and take in new ideas I think so. I'm okay. I'm usually the person that when we go, for instance, my group of friends will go to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Let's say we go there five times. I'm the person that the first five times will never get the same meal until I find the thing that, that I really dig. Mm -hmm. And then I'm only eating that thing ever, forever at that place. <laughs> right. Okay. I, once I find my thing, it's, I'm also one of those people, I'm sure many people do it, is like when you find a song, you hear it until you cannot hear it yeah. anymore. That's all you day, play a, a day. I'm not the guy that has constantly mu new music, for instance. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, well, where I got that from is, I think my mom is similar in the sense that she also is very open to these mm -hmm. ideas. Um, also, probably fairly esoteric as a person. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, I don't know, but a group of friends certainly are also uh, yeah. pretty explorational, mm -hmm. in, uh, but in very different ways. Many travel a lot uh, and a lot of different interests. Okay, so growing up, what did your parents do for a living? Um, my mother works as... Uh, how would you translate that? Basically, works as a at the doctor's office. Okay. And she does like, um, you know, the intake. Uh, how do you call this? Yeah. Like she gets so, everyone set up and she gets them into their appointments and yeah, stuff and like we'll that. put on casts and whatnot or take blood and these okay. types of things. Mm -hmm. Basically, like a nurse at a doctor's office, yeah. pretty much, right? Um, and my father initially, uh, I think he initially was an electrician, mm -hmm. uh, then a technician. And then he worked himself up to be a product manager for Xerox in Ooh. Germany. And uh, then, I mean, he still works for Xerox. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, uh, honestly, like, uh, for instance, I did an apprenticeship there. And then not an apprenticeship, uh, like a... Um, internship? Internship, yes, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I was interested in that regard. I thought... To, for the longest time that I was going to be a programmer uh, mm -hmm. in school. That didn't, I'm not sure if that te uh, if a teacher turned me off of that, but I never got into that, which I honestly regret a little bit. I think mm -hmm. honestly what, what coders are saying that it's almost liter a point of literacy now to be able to write some kind of code is probably true. I'm yeah. just lucky enough to not be born 20 years later. We'll, we'll, this will become a bigger problem, I think. Um, I always wanted to get into it, and eventually I probably will mm -hmm. when the schedule allows, but yeah. Um, otherwise, I guess one would have to mention my grandmother because she was also uh, around a lot. She was um, a tailor. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we stayed with my grandmother probably four times a week when, when my mother started work, working again. And yeah, she was pretty formative as well for, for me, I think. Just, she also was a gardener to this day. I had this, this, uh, this period where I wasn't as interested in plants. Mm -hmm. 
during my mid-twenties, but now I enjoy growing plants. So, so you, you so said, biology. Yeah, so you said we. Do you have uh, brothers and sisters? I have a sister. Um, she's three years younger, so I'm the older brother. Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's interesting. My sister had a heart problem very mm-hmm. early in life. Um, and I think through that, just living through that, ha- having to have open heart surgery and whatnot, Ooh. she honestly became one of the strongest people I know. She was always, the, the heart surgery made it so that her life expectancy would have been very limited if no uh, surgery was taking place. Honestly, hilarious. Nowadays, it's, it's a minor thing. Yeah. You just, like, medicine improves so quickly nowadays. Um, it's like a minor thing that you yeah. can fix. Then you stay in the hospital for one night and then you can go home. But back then, it was open heart surgery and whatnot. And it was yeah. very scary. And she was honestly behind because um, what she had was, you know, your heart has um, like a, a wall, yeah. wall between the, the uh, I'm missing the English words. This is where English fails me when I get into these technicalities, right? But um, uh, it's where the oxygenated blood and the no, yeah, not oxygenated blood, blood are separated. Now, she mm-hmm. had a hole in there. Ooh. So... That means you constantly has like, have like mixed blood, meaning you get more, less oxygen to your muscles, right? Mm-hmm. So that needed to be fixed. She was behind in school because of that. Also because of having to stay in hospital a long time, uh, struggled for a long time. And then honestly, I think it would have to be starting 14. She just exploded in, in performance. Um, she uh, got her school back on track eventually uh, finished so she could start studying, but first did an apprenticeship, then studied and is now the head of uh, kindergarten, actually. Yeah, honestly, just like seeing her go through that process certainly didn't help that uh, the the idea of the mortality. uh, But um, yeah, it's it's uh it's crazy how she has uh, so, developed. So were you the type of brother that is like very protective of your little sister? Were you were you like no just leave me alone I don't want to deal with you like what type of brother were you? Huh. Um, I would I would say there were definitely times where we were like cat and mice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on she went to my school mm-hmm. that I went to then, and I think then I became very protective for the time that we shared that that school. Um, I think it quickly became the case that she didn't need protection any longer. She, uh, she, she a badass? Definitely, yeah. Like, um, not, not that she's into fighting sports or whatever, yeah. but she has, she has the ability to stand up for herself. Mm-hmm. Like, for instance, when we, when we had to communicate with health insurances or whatever, you don't want to have that, her on the phone when you're like the clock there you're you're getting stomped into the ground right she just learned through the hardships in her life that there's there's no reason to be messed with right Uh so um i think then i uh, let off we let's say we meet maybe every three weeks now Uh um but yeah uh it's just i think it's there's definitely a gender difference Right, you're mm-hmm. not into the same things. If it was a little yeah. brother, I think uh, there's just more closeness, probably. But honestly, she also assisted me when I had these problems w- uh, in my mid twenties, even as an early twenty uh, person. And um, yeah, I, I'm, honestly, I like, needed protection then. Yeah, yeah, I imagine getting like, especially like, it sounds like she was fairly young when she needed open heart surgery. Yeah, uh, I think like, she was ten. I feel yeah. like that would that would cause you to like that's a very real life thing to happen when you're mm-hmm. ten. Like, like the the extent of that. Like people don't have events like that happen like most of the time till like they're they're, they're like later in life. And this like yeah. idea of mortality is probably very different mm-hmm. um, when you're that young. It's also you're uh, you're in the hospital. Yeah, and it's the same part of the hospital where there's people where there's children with cancer. 
Yep. And you're sitting in these playrooms and playing with these children, you're making friends, and then your parents have to tell you he's not coming back. And I'm not sure how my parents wrapped that up, if they just said, oh, he's, he's been released. But very frequently, these died. And just at the same time, you cannot keep a brother from, the, uh, from his sister. So the, it was a, honestly a, a pretty hard situation for my parents, too. What do you do? Do you bring me to the hospital frequently? I want to go. Uh, then I'm also in that environment, just psychologically, also being separated from your parents fr very frequently and having to stay with your grandmother because of that. Mm -hmm. It's honestly, nobody should be going through that at that point in life, right? As yeah. parents, as, as children. And How whatnot. old were you at the time? <sighs> I think so. I think my sister was, if I remember correctly, nine, and I would have been 12. Did you, did you have a grasp on the, on the situation? Like, were you old enough to, like, understand what was going on and the, the possible consequences? Mm, I think so. I think so. I was, I was very... Honestly, I wasn't aware of what death is. I think the first person that I knew who was dead uh, was when I was 18, and that was my grandmother. Before that, no, I didn't need, know a single person for the longest time. Maybe someone that you met like once or twice in life. Yeah. And you just see, okay, that's an abstract thought, though. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I knew that there was immense danger of things going wrong. I didn't know what that mean, meant. Yeah. And I think to a point, you cannot know what it means yeah. to lose someone. Like, that's an experience that's ineffable and in the moment is, is also wildly different based on the person that it is. Yeah, yeah I, I would 100% agree with that. Um, so looking at school, how, what type of student were you like growing up through school? Like Mostly, okay, I was in elementary school. Yeah. Me and my friend were the best in this school pretty much when they started giving grades. Mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, I think, okay, that, that wouldn't mean anything to you, but I, I, I had mostly A's, and it's not like in the United States that I, I think there's a, some inflationary thing going on in the United States where I hear that so many students in each year have like all A's. Yeah. That is the thing that doesn't happen and especially didn't happen at the, um, at the school that I went to afterwards. Mm hmm we have a, a system called gym, gymnasium or gymnasium. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's three different levels. Exactly, yes. And um, at my school, when we were done with school, we had w one uh, girl in our class that had the first 1.0. So one is the best grade, mm -hmm. okay? And you could technically get a 1+, plus, but she was the first in 28 years to get all A's. 28 really? years. This doesn't happen, right? So, interestingly, after elementary school, I think fifth grade, sixth grade were still very good, and then I mm -hmm. dropped off a cliff. Like, very yeah, many do, if I found out. And uh, I think it's just hormones kicking in, is, is what my experience now is with... Um, with so I teach uh, yeah. on the side, and, or as a half-time, some used to do it full-time. And... Um, it's, uh, I think there's just something especially bad in boys. Like, 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, they just drop off a cliff, and you really, you need, really need to pick them up, because it is, it is a, the pattern is not that they fall off a cliff on one subject. Mm -hmm. It's that all the subjects get bad. They don't pay attention in uh, school, they don't do their homework, um, don't study for class tests, there, it's, it's sort of like really, there's no drive almost, mm -hmm. right? It's this rebellion against the system almost. And then you hopefully get someone that puts you on the right track and gets you back because it takes time. You, you cannot slack off for three years, oh, expect yeah. to be back immediately when, when things get serious and now you have a, um, um, like, it goes towards the end of your school and you have to apply to universities or to jobs with that uh, piece yeah. of paper, right? 
Yeah, so, and for for German schools, there's like three different layers, like, like elementary school, and then you go to a next set of schools, and you get you get placed, don't you? Like between like yes. the the top, and then you get it one more time for like what would be functionally equivalent to high school, right? Like you have like a middle mm-hmm. school one, and then a high school one. So if you do bad at all for like your your middle school, then your placement where they put you for your high school is going to be significantly different too, right? I mean, okay, so basically what happens is fifth grade to tenth grade, you get put into a school that is. Three, there's three broad systems and one system that incorporates all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we call it Hauptschule, Realschule, Gymnasium. And then there's uh, Gesamtschule that incorporates all of them. Yeah. Hauptschule is the basic school and it's like mostly problematic children go there that mm-hmm. had really big problems. Also in Germany, a lot of uh, immigration happening. So a lot of them come from households that don't speak German natively. So there's certain differences in German that then also causes problems in other subjects because you cannot communicate uh, yeah. sufficiently, right? And then you try to get these children back to a level so they can, I mean, they could switch at any given point. If their grades are good enough, you can just, the parents, for instance, can go to another school and say, okay, can you, can you accept my child here after the school year? And then uh, after the 10th grade, you can either go look for a job, get an apprenticeship, yeah. The apprenticeship program in Germany is honestly very good, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, you basically have school as well as uh, job tra- on the job training. You get practical knowledge. And also, I think these types of jobs are doing pretty okay in Germany, right? And um, Or you could, after 10th grade, you could go to a gymnasium or some special schools, but uh, that's more like an outlier. And then you can do two or thro- three more years. We keep fluctuating how long that takes. And that qualifies you to go to university. Yeah. And it's not like in, uh, in the US where you have college first. You immediately start university and you can, it's not a broad education then. You basically mm-hmm. have to choose a sharp subject. You go into biology, you go into uh, math or in, uh, IT or whatever, right? Yeah. So um, I, chose law school uh, back then so first off <laughs> i was one of the guys that still had to do mandatory military service that was the thing in germany so after uh my a levels i was oh, it was very unfair my friends were traveling the world going to australia just like buying a an old sierra uh combi like like compact and just driving across australia and enjoying the freedom of not having school and i was pulled from the German government to, do, to go to um, the military. And um, I ended up extending a little bit mm-hmm. for the military service. Honestly, only the three, first three months were basic military service. That, that's basic training. Yeah. After that, I was very, very lucky. A, I was able to stay in Dusseldorf, so live with my parents, and B, it was really, it had nothing to do with military in the strict sense, sense. I was, so you have to do these borderline IQ tests and they place you based on that and also uh, education. They place you to different jobs. And I took that test ser- seriously. Some of my friends didn't and that was so dumb by them. But uh, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to get a job with, um, okay, in German it's called Centrales Messer und Event Marketing der Bundeswehr which is basically you go to exhibitions and just try to recruit people and oh. just travel across Germany, um, met a lot of people. Um, I mean, I didn't like being away from home. I certainly yeah. always enjoyed my PC very much, but uh, it wasn't really that military uh, style. And also my superiors really put emphasis on giving me life skills, really. Like, I remember one of my superiors just, like, ripping my tie off because I, I was, like, went to my father who didn't have much time, you know, being a product manager uh, for Xerox. Like, a lot of time, um, w- he was not at home. So mm-hmm. I was like, uh, can you tie me a tie so I can take it with me, put it in my suitcase, already tied, and then I just could put it on. And one of my superiors like, this one is too long. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll fix it. And he just goes and opens it up completely. And I'm standing there, I have no idea how, how to tie a tie. 
So for 45 minutes, I was like back in the room trying to tie a tie. There was no, um, no Google back then. Yeah. Right? I didn't have a yeah. smartphone or anything, right? We didn't have an internet connection. So I was just trying and trying and eventually think some medic just came in that was with us at this exhibition and just helped me practice. And then eventually I got it. Another thing my superiors did was just like, okay, you're hosting this raffle now. You're doing it by yourself. And I was honestly introverted and really not that outgoing. And um, just being forced to do that was in the moment a nightmare, but in, in hindsight, a pretty important skill to learn because eventually yeah. you never get fully comfortable with it uh, uh, if you're a, a bend of certain person, I would say, if you're an introvert. But um, uh, it became less of an absolute shock and terror, the exercise. So eventually, um, yeah, we, some things we shouldn't have done. I was very, very lucky that I left the Bundeswehr and the, like, I think three weeks after, my team went to Gamescom mm -hmm. and had a, an exhibition stand next to Call of Duty. And that was oh, one wow. of the worst things. I was very, very lucky to not be, have been there. I would have liked to be at Gamescom, but Jesus Christ, that was so tasteless. And um, yeah, I, in general, I think during that time in the military, I applied for three different fields. I didn't know what to do. Really? I applied which, which for fields? biology, psychology, and law. <laughs> and I had no idea of deadlines. So the first acceptance letter comes in. It's like, oh, it's law school. Guess we're doing law school then. I'm, I'm getting in an apartment. I'm setting up. And suddenly all these other acceptance letters come in. And I would have probably liked rather to do psychology. I just th thought they didn't want me. Yeah. So I was like, okay, you already have this apartment. Let's try law school. That was and the, that was, were you, were you really like you, you, psychology is really hard to get into in Germany from what I've heard. Uh, yeah. That it's, it's actually like the, the cream of the crop of like students get into psychology in Germany. You must have done, did you do really, really well in school mm, later no. on? No. How the did thing you get is, into psychology? There's a lottery. <laughs> um, okay. So, okay. The one thing. The one thing that you have to say is if you do mandatory military service, it acts as if you waited four semesters mm -hmm. um, for that study, just to okay. encourage people to do it, right? Even though it was mandatory, but there's ways to get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Medical stuff. So that certainly weighed into it, right? And um, there was some lottery factor to it as well. I wasn't, I wasn't a 1.0 student that some, some of these... Uh, like I think Baroy was because I think I remember when I had Baroy on, he talked about yes. how how he he really no, wished he, that he would have actually went for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he. I think he uh, he was always very good in maths and um, yeah. So yeah, it honestly biology would have been fine as well. I think mm -hmm. honestly, uh, in in the aftermath, even though I didn't end up then studying it in the second time, uh, both biology and. Psychology, I would have probably stuck to and uh, done, get, mm -hmm. get done. Um, I think there's a universe, a parallel universe, where th few things go differently and also get done with law school because I, it wasn't absolutely miserable. Um, I was in law school, I was like, okay. So you were an average student, probably because you realized too late that you got to get your shit together. And then I thought, okay, let's do it in law school. And mm -hmm. in the first semester, you have the option to write all the, the exams yeah. for the entire year, which basically nobody does. But I had a, I, I met a crazy good um, German Russian guy, and he was very dedicated. And he also played WoW. So we had a lot in common in that regard. And I just decided with him, let's just do the first year in half a year. Let's just get that, all of that out of the way. Now, that was, that was suicide because... Was it to play WoW more? Was it like, yeah. if we do it all right away, we can play a lot of WoW without breaks? No, it's just, I think at the time, we both thought we just wanted to be good law school students. 
um, because he probably had the same issues with um, yeah. school previously as well, but uh, or issues, but yeah. Um, and <laughs> I the grades were not not bad, honestly, pretty mm -hmm. good. And um, then you have half a year off, basically, or you could just go like skip a skip a half a year and just take the classes that the next year is already doing. Yeah. We didn't feel like that. So, what of Warcraft? Um, it was bad. I, um, I left Dusseldorf for, I studied in Bielefeld, I think at 85 kilograms, mm -hmm. which is like, I don't know the, what the conversion, direct conversion is, but something, probably like, the factor is probably like 2 point, times 2.1. Yeah, so like, it sounds, sounds right. I could look it up. But. A year later, I think one and a half years later, I put on what must have been 35 kilograms. Oh, God. So, the first half a year, I wasn't, I wasn't eating terribly. But I had so much money saved up from military service that I just could just order out every evening. And I was just playing WoW. I, I was... During that time, I wasn't an absolute top player, but we were invited to tournaments, mm -hmm. uh, to Gamescom and whatnot. And... Um, yeah, but I didn't take care of myself much. And that took a lot of dedication then in early 20s even though it later then again deteriorated to the point where I'm now. But, um, uh, yeah. So, um, so you're, you're in law school um, mm -hmm. and you're doing that. And, like, obviously going to law school was kind of a big deal. Um, how long did you do military service for? I think it was 14 months. When okay. you have mandatory military service is nine months. And then mm -hmm. I extended because I had, otherwise I had n uh, five months of nothing to do. And, crucially... They pay you way better once you extend. So beforehand, it's always, obviously a pittance. I think I was mm -hmm. making 350 euros a month. Afterwards, I was making, I think, 1,400 euros, but oh, wow. also got all the benefits of being outside, having a lot of uh, extra hours. And I was still living at home. I, I didn't have any expenses, so I could, could just save a lot. Then I got into poker and also, like, made it much more than it was and um yeah honestly through law school i didn't like some some students had to do other jobs i think i could have gotten through law school without uh, having to do other jobs mm -hmm. uh, with the exception probably because there's one ridiculous thing in germany is like you have to have these prep courses for uh for the big exams because they're so 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 important Mm -hmm. um, like 60% of your grade is done in three, three days. Ugh. And the six years beforehand don't matter much. Okay. So these prep courses are ridiculously expensive to this day, like 80 bucks an hour or something. And Ooh. you've got to have hundreds of hours potentially, right? Depending on mm -hmm. how well you practice yourself. And I, I think I wouldn't have needed as many because I learned probably better by myself. I, if, mm -hmm. I, if I take courses, a very pointed question. I'm actually a, a nightmare customer for someone that does my profession now, <laughs> where I <laughs> just go in, okay, can you explain this, this, this? Okay, three hours, I'm done, right? I'm not, exper like, I'm not, I wouldn't give the, the entire work of trying to find all the material and uh, trying to figure out a structure. I'm, I would figure that out rather by myself. And, okay. Um, so you mentioned a very interesting is that you played poker, okay, mm -hmm. and you made a lot of money playing poker. Was this just playing with people that you knew that you were doing, or were you actually going to like casinos and playing poker? Both. Uh, I was playing online. Mm -hmm. uh, that existed then eventually. Yeah. Okay. And we were also. It was interesting. Um, in law school, I uh, and that was for m big money too. That's. Mm -hmm. um, I, I met a couple of older students. They were like um, our instructors during the first couple of weeks. And they were like, oh, you're playing poker and whatnot. And then uh, I got to this table and it was honestly, it was a riot. The type of characters that were there, like all the token characters. We had a, uh, I 
I'm not I'm not sure if he went to, was into quantum physics, but he definitely did physics. But he also did a lot of mushrooms while playing, or at least <laughs> <laughs> at least weed. Um, we had the stuck up uh, mm -hmm. law stu school stu students, you know, with the um, with the ties go going into university and whatnot. Um, we had a couple of women that were honestly very hard to crack. We had a psychology a PhD student that was very scary, who <laughs> pretended to always know what we're thinking. And that honestly, is the, trick. the thing is, he, as far as I remember, he specialized in body language. Mm -hmm. And later on, it's interesting because now that's that was a pretty big book by the, this FBI guy. But body of mind, I've, I've, I've actually have it. Um, it's very cool. Yeah. It's a lot of fun yeah. to read. I recently read this and th thought, man, this guy told us all these things because a lot of body language is just self soothing. Mm -hmm. Now you can infer why does someone need self soothing in that moment? Yeah. Or what is something that someone does in specific situations? If you know cognizance of that, especially on life tables, tells are huge. If you are playing in a group of people that consistently play against each other. Yeah. It's probably less useful if you just go to a casino, even though it probably still is. But just like every week, just meeting up there, playing live tables, it, it, they were all amazing players, honestly. Probably much better than I was. But that's how I learned the ropes there. Just like going through that absolute theater of a cast um, playing there. And uh, yeah, also just like the different aspects that everyone brought to the table. Mm hmm that that's kind of cool. Uh, did you did you keep up playing poker throughout uh, college or university? I mean, no. or did you drop it? No. At at some point, it just gets too stressful. Like it really <laughs> weighs. That's why, on Broy, you. that's why Broy dropped it. Like when I had Broy mm -hmm. on the show, he, there was one point where he said, "I think he was betting like something like five grand a week." Um, yeah, I know. Like something insane. He was like, "I can't do this anymore." Like mm -hmm. it's it's too. Like he started with like fifty dollars. That's what. Like he's like, I started with fifty dollars. I got it to where I was doing like two to five grand a week, and I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which I I don't blame. So I kind of want to take a step back though, because um, obviously you had this military service. One of the things you mentioned earlier is that you lost someone very influential and significant in your life when you were eighteen. Mm -hmm. Um, your your grandma, um, and that was really your first like instance of someone really important to you passing away um mm -hmm. do you remember what that was like and how you how you went through it yeah it was so i remember i got my driver's license and uh, um or i was in the process of getting my driver's license and my grandma got worse like we still used to go there fairly frequently but um for instance i would uh, go to my grandma and i would knock on the door and she would have already. She already did collapse on the ground or whatever. She had. Um, she had an artificial heart wealth for for one. She also started with Alzheimer's pretty quickly, uh, like terrible forgetfulness. Um, mm. It got pretty bad then, and um, then eventually, uh, she uh, had a stroke, and. Um, she had to take, uh, uh, I'm not sure what it's called. It's in German, it's called Makuma. It's like a, a medication that because of the artificial valve, it's very easy to build clots that way. So you got to take something that a blood, blood thinner. thinner and still sh through the blood thinner, she still got that. So um, first it paralyzed her uh, for the most part. We also had to find or were preparing to find uh, special retirement homes. And then I remember I got my driver's license and I was like, mom, I got my driver's license. And she's like, oh yeah, that's, that's amazing. Uh, can you pick me up from a hospital? And I arrive at the hospital and she has another stroke right then and there. And my mom's like, I cannot uh, go, go now. And I stayed for the longest time, but I eventually next year, day school and whatnot. And I drove my mom's car home. And just that ride was, I, I could tell you every single person that I encountered on that, on that drive, still to this day. I remember it so vividly, just A, being in the car the first time alone. And then just with all these emotions, like, what does that mean now? Right? Because 
it was very obvious that this was not going to improve that situation, right? It wasn't definitive yet, but and um, yeah, it's it's also during that time, first relationship and whatnot. Uh, don't want to delve too much into that, but but that was in a healthy place as well, and um, yeah, it was honestly a trying time. Like mm -hmm. just being confronted with all these pressure points. Um, Did you break? Because I would have broken. Like I remember when my grandfather died when I was fifteen, um, mm -hmm. and like he just it was one day he was alive and the next day he wasn't, um, and I like left to go visit and I came back and like my parents t told me to go do chores and they didn't even tell me he died. Um, and I walked upstairs cause I used to run upstairs all the time to say hi to him and he wasn't there. And so like finding that out was just so sudden that I remember it just crushed me. Mm -hmm. I think these situations in life, we're, we're usually, uh, animals of habit. Yeah. And when these traumatic experiences happen, it breaks your part. But you got an opportunity to build yourself together. There's this, I, I know, like if someone follows me and will watch this, they probably are sick of this uh, imagery, but this is a Japanese art called skinsugi, where it's like a bro, they, they have specific art where they break a bowl or a, bro, a bowl gets broken onto the ground and they put it together in a unique way and uh, fuse it with gold or whatever mm -hmm. metal in order to make it more beautiful because these these breaks these cracks they aren't planned right they're not deliberate they're just mm -hmm. like this happened and i think that was one of those traumatic events where i didn't you you have an opportunity to become a better person after this but you definitely got to also watch out that you're not turning for the worst i think mm -hmm. overall it that was one thing that would generally be considered uh negative I mm -hmm. turned more intro uh, introverted, didn't go out with my friends whatsoever anymore. Mostly turned to World of Warcraft. And um, then, yeah, it, it took a while. And I think then really, yeah, I think military service was the thing that yeah. was once again a, a, enough of a big change in my life to, to get out of that shell. But yeah, that's, that, that was probably, let me think, two years apart, these events. So yeah. That year of school was not fun. So I, I was going to ask you, one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of people, especially in esports, uh, there's something that almost always drives people to games. Uh, was this one of those events that really drove you harder into games? Like before people play and like a, norm, a lot of times they maintain like social relationships out. Um, I know for a lot of people, especially pro players too, there's like an event somewhere between like, uh, like 13 and 17 where people just all in on like video gaming. And it's like mm. the most, it, the priority level of it increases significantly. Um, was mm -hmm. this that moment that did it or was it still a big priority before that? It was a big priority before that, but it got enforced once my grandma started with the Alzheimer's thing mm -hmm. because then we couldn't also go to her anymore. I was home much more. I was much more home by myself. You know, like you, you turn from a child that goes to his grandma to gets his keys and goes home by himself and then mm -hmm. is uh, responsible for yourself, right? Which honestly, as parents, that's completely fine to say to a 15 year old, you go home by yourself. I'll be home in yeah. two hours after that, right? And that suddenly that gives you the freedom to say i'm not going to do homework nobody's supervising mm -hmm. me here i can say to my parents that i did homework and uh go into video games yeah pretty heavily i remember i had this huge discussion man this will make me look ancient but um during that time internet was honestly pretty awful for the most part yeah. dsl was not at all established even though most of my friends had it i didn't even have isdn i had mm -hmm. a 50 was was a 50k 56k modem uh yeah, where right. when my mom was on the telephone while i was in my starcraft game you could hear her talk through that little speaker on the modem it was torture i was spending most of my allowance i think i uh, remember back then on aol uh like prepaid cards or whatever it was and i had this huge discussion with my parents because my friends were also gamers at that time we're mm -hmm. playing counter strike we're playing starcraft and playing Counter-Strike with a, with a modem, it not only does it not have the bandwidth, so I always need to, uh, to ask my father to download patches so he can burn them onto CDs <laughs> to bring uh, home, but um, it also is terrible ping. 
I was playing mm -hmm. on 200 ping while everyone else was playing with 40 ping. So I had this huge discussion with my parents and my par parents first were stern and I was playing soccer throughout all my, um, my youth. And mm -hmm. I remember one time we were like, after a match, we were just sitting in the bar uh, at the, uh, at the pitch. And I was like discussing that with my father and my father said, okay, you got to reach this, this great. And you also got to do well in soccer. Not that he gave too much on it, but it was more like you got to tr try at something, right? Yeah. I wasn't trying uh, at that time. So I was like, I really want DSL. So I ended up making that goal. Mm. And DSL did, then did exactly the counter thing to that, because then I had access to the internet, could download the games I wanted, could play uh, the games I wanted. Also, it wasn't a drain anymore on my allowance. I usually was always a person that uh, doesn't spend much, always saves. Yeah. And um, yeah, that, that just allowed me to <laughs> remember. We were playing Warcraft 3. We were honestly pretty good. I think we, we were sponsored for a while by a smaller team. Didn't fly out to Lance, though. But we were probably on the cusp of getting there. And then um, uh, I remember like having a crazy friend who was also crazy good at it. And um, I, we, we, all, we were all saying, okay, World of Warcraft coming out. Pff, who's going to pay 12 bucks a month for that? <laughs> and then everyone was playing play 12 uh, bucks for that. But yeah. my friends got off it like three months later. For me, it took probably until I was 21 or 22 to get off World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. I turned to esports. I mean, I was in, in Walker, uh, Walker 3, I was already replay approving. Like, I was working for, not working, but like volunteering at replays.com, mm -hmm. like going through replays because I go, was going to do that anyway. And then just writing short reviews if there was a, an amazing game, right? And mm -hmm. then in World of Warcraft, I was mostly a player for the, for the start of it. And then I think in, Burning Crusade, my friend was like, okay, we're dominating this uh, German battleground. Let's go to the English one. And that's when my esports uh, career, I would say, really started, where I started mm -hmm. writing uh, for a website called, or not for, but on a website called Game Ride, and got heavily into creating content because, mm -hmm. <sighs> like, I was trying really hard, and for the amount of trying I did in World of Warcraft, I was honestly not as good as one would, at, at, as the time investment was warranted. Mm -hmm. was also that, at that point where you try too much, and therefore, like, your performance gets worse. You're not actively thinking. I was just, like, grooving through it. That was yeah. already also in law school, right? Like, first year of law school, I dropped World of Warcraft completely. I canceled my subscription. Then I, this second half hits, and I don't have to leave the, my apartment anymore. Yeah. I can order food. The environment of, around the apartment is terrible, but it was cheap, and I liked to save money. And I would just then counter to my savings thing, order food every night, and just play World of Warcraft. I was a terrible rager. Not mm -hmm. absolutely awful. I wasn't absolutely destroying equipment. But it was definitely like impulsive. Oh, sick. Was probably a terrible teammate. And when I when I actually was calm, because basically I was the type of teammate you probably want to have when you're winning. Mm -hmm. Because I I usually like was making jokes, keeping the mood up during that. Now if you're getting absolutely plastered, I was the worst. I was actually so bad. Like it was a time where we were playing such trash World of Warcraft that yeah, I, I became impossible to play with, I think, for a while. Yeah. Did they kick you? Cause... No, they did not. They were good friends of mine. Okay. They were one German, one Austrian guy. I remember we uh they drove to Düsseldorf. My mother had has like it's not very usual for America, I think, but in Germany there's like because we don't most of the people rent, so they don't, mm -hmm. don't have gardens. But, but what they can do is rent a garden outside. And then there's just like these huge 
communities of just like little garden houses and then just stacked against That's each cool. other. And my mom still has that one. It, everything's in there, shower, like it's, it's probably, I mean, 20 square meters or whatever, but um, mm-hmm. uh, has beds and, uh, and a kitchen and a toilet and whatnot, oh, basically all you need. And I remember bringing them there for uh, Gamescom, where we. That was honestly pretty messed up. We were supposed to compete there, and then I've, uh, the Mouse Sports team, because they were the sponsored ones, I was just content creator, really, and then also uh, playing at a, a decent level. And also, we hit the meta that worked well for us. Um, they just pushed us out last minute. We ch- showed up there with all our keyboards and whatnot, and they're like, yeah, this wow. guy actually took this one. Yeah, it was awful. And. To be fair, though, directly before the tournament, like a week before, our strategy, all, our meta composition was heavily nerfed, so we probably would have absolutely made a fool of ourselves. But um, before then, we were, like the, the weeks previously, we were beating the best European teams pretty regularly. So, yeah. Lucky. So, kind of looking at World of Warcraft being such a huge part, did your grades ever fall, or were you always able to keep them up? Yes, they did. Uh, they definitely fell. I had to. Okay, so in German uh, school, if you okay, what would be the equivalent? F is a failing grade, right? Is D a uh, passing grade? Uh, yes, D is passing. F is okay. failing. So we have three main subjects. Subjects with German, English, and math are three main sh- subjects. If you have all D's, that's fine. You pass. If one of those is uh, an F and the other ones are D's. You, you, fail. Are, you fail unless you have to, you can, after the summer break, you then have a, a, a written test and an oral exam. And if you pass those, they upgrade the, the F to a D and you pass. And I had to do one of those in French because French was the, was the fourth main subject. Those six weeks sucked. They, they absolutely sucked. My parents put me through, they didn't even bother with like, uh, particular like preparation for that they just put me in a french course like hardcore three hours every day for six weeks must have been been super expensive so i was hating that like my entire summer holiday was it wasn't like i was coming home and my mom just let me be then because i I did three of uh, three hours of french no then i was doing homework that the lady gave me and i was also learning vocabulary right so these summer holidays sucked, and things certainly improved after that. I turned into a good B student in French after mm-hmm. that, and most of the other grades improved because, man, the last thing I wanted was to go through that process again. I, that was mm-hmm. sort of a wake-up call, and things picked up after that, right? But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think that was a valuable experience, just like, mm-hmm. yeah. I wish I didn't drop French after. I, I don't know what would... You can ask... So, in ninth grade, then you could keep doing French? Yeah. Or, or you basically vote it off. And mm-hmm. I, even though I was a B student, I was like, oh yeah, this is this thing that inflicted a lot of pain onto me. Be gone, right? Even though I was pretty good at that. Yeah. So, I wish I kept up with it, because uh, having a third language would have been be sweet yeah i think that'd be pretty cool so did did you ever get hurt in law school because of world of warcraft uh so um the first year uh, uh, semester i didn't play at all yeah so that wasn't a problem then i um played only world of warcraft and then i was on the crossroads where i was making money from creating content yeah. in uh, world of warcraft um, I was with Complexity already at the time, the North American organization. I was writing for them and then also had some gigs for, uh, as a team manager for one of yeah. their teams. But being European, the, for an American organization, the, uh, the opportunities are limited and still esports is not that advanced that you can get that there's just like full time jobs for someone that doesn't have a uni- uh, university um, yeah. education. Uh, there are not that many uh, opportunities. So, um, I was like, I like writing though. I really mm-hmm. like writing. So I dropped law school 
pretty quickly also just things happened at the law yeah. school after the half year uh, that I was gone. I, um, I got in an unfortunate social situation where maybe like I would definitely approach it differently nowadays, but, uh, yeah, I was kind of, uh, ejected from the group that I mm -hmm. interact with socially. And then I was just in a city really far off campus and um yeah i just didn't find myself ba way back in so mm -hmm. basically i stayed a student for uh, uh organizational or like systematic uh reasons because otherwise you would have to apply for um unemployment and whatnot yeah. i didn't want to do that i i still was making money and could live uh, move back with my parents and um they were separating at the time anyway, so there was a lot of room in the in the flat, even though it was never that small. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was I initially wanted to go all in on esports, and mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so what does a writer need? There was no journalism education in Germany that was reputable. It was just private universities that ha had honestly a terrible curriculum at the time, and most of the uh, journalists actually either went to law school in Germany or did German. So, yeah. or Germanistic, strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm doing German and English because I want to write in English and went to university for that. But, um, yeah, it's... Um, did, did you finish university for that? Uh, no. I uh, didn't get to for certain reasons. Yeah. And... Um, that's, I mean, in, in effect, and that's also one thing that I realized throughout um, my, uh, my life that in Germany, it's very important what a piece of paper says you can do. Yeah. And that doesn't mean in effect that you're qualified. I understand yeah. why you can pay me less for that because I don't have a certificate, but you cannot mm -hmm. evaluate my ability yeah, to do 100%. so. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. So you you were working in uh, writing and you were you were kind of all inning on esports. This were, I have a lot of questions that kind of about this, yeah. um, like the getting into esports because this was very early on, and especially when I was listening to like Volumail's podcast, it always felt like there was an opportunity that for whatever reason you either decided to pass up and it ended up turning out to be something bigger, or like you got screwed over, like. Mm. Like, like I heard about, like, I, I want to say there was like four different things. Like I know at one point you got asked if you wanted to write for SK gaming, which you said, yep. you know, the money isn't there for it, but SK gaming ended up being a fairly prolific, um, uh, writing organization that had a lot of big names come out of it and move on to other things. Like yeah. uh, I think Richard Lewis was there. I th think th Thorin, Thorin was actually the guy that asked me to join yeah. SK gaming. Yeah. yeah. So Thorin was there. there I want to say there was two other people there who were also like now are considered fairly big, mm -hmm. big known mm -hmm. writers. Um, so I kind of want to like ask about, do you feel like your career has been a lot of like, uh, is it something you're proud of and happy of? Or do you feel like you've always like, like either not taken risk or kind of just been screwed over? Um, okay. So I definitely was screwed over on several occasions. Mm -hmm. I also think that on many occasions it was naive on my part on others. I actually was legitimately, if I went to a lawyer, he would have helped me get that straight right mm -hmm. um i would say like it's it's not like i i had a i just started esports at 21 and i'm still yeah. in this position like there was definitely like f solid five or six years after my uh friend who i also worked with on esports projects he was like the backend developer for the sites that i uh, worked on um that just turned me off esports for a while like mlg dropped world of warcraft i really loved work world of warcraft basically blizzard just completely stopped supporting the game like from one day like i people don't realize how big world of warcraft was i'm mm -hmm. i in 2000 wait let me think must have been 2009 2010 2011 i was getting more hits a day than i'm doing now mm -hmm. i was popping off in that game and suddenly Dead. That is all gone because StarCraft 2 comes out and no tournament, tournament circuit wants to have two Blizzard games on because then Wells is uh, upset about that. 
So they got to make room for what at the time was the biggest esport in terms of viewership. It mm -hmm. wasn't close. Like I remember going to CBIT, talking to people there. Yeah, they basically told us it's being dropped from an IAM circuit while having more viewership than Quake and CSGO combined. And it was terrible. Like I just, um, like MLG used to, Wreckful tells a story to this day where there was, they, technically they owe these players still a world championship final. Mm -hmm. that, like they had a circuit, circuit points were accrued, and then a big final should have happened for a bunch of money. That never came to, uh, to happen because of the decision uh, Blizzard made behind the scenes. And I was like, okay, maybe you could move into content creation. And I honestly, I was still probably a pretty good player at the time. I wonder what would have happened. Okay, this is terrible to think about, but I think I would have gotten into streaming fairly early on. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think there's a universe where I react differently to that situation. I don't delve into academia completely. Mm -hmm. I just keep content creation up and move into streaming and get to the point where I could make a living off of that. Mm -hmm. Also, what my biggest weakness, honestly, is in content creation to this day is that I just love the games too much that I'm reporting. To, it's, it's such a terrible idea. Like this week, I really try to get into League of Legends just to have a second game. Like it's like, you know how, how they say, um, diversify your stock Your portfolio, uh, options. yeah. Yeah, I'm not doing that whatsoever. Like I'm at completely once again at the at the merits of uh, Blizzard Entertainment to get this thing off the ground, and my career and the hits I'm getting is proportional to the audience that Overwatch accrues, and it's a terrible career decision, actually. Yeah. Um, I will. But I that. gotta love the game site that I report on. Yeah. Um, I do some news for the other stuff now that's that's easy to do but i gotta learn how to either love other games simultaneously mm -hmm. and that's hard because i'm not a person okay this is there's a do you know who pen Gillette is yeah i do he's a magician because i love magic i know i yeah. love pen Gillette. <laughs> um he had this story how he had a heart issue and he was mm -hmm. a an old father so he's like, and his doctor tells him, okay, you've got to lose a lot of weight. Yeah. This is not healthy. And he has this, this thing where he says, um, people always preach this all in, all in balance, you know, always like not too much, not too much. And the middle way, so to speak. Yeah. I'm not that. And he basically says, I don't respect people who do uh, things in measured ways. I am not like people who do it in measured ways. I got to do it obsessively. I got to go nuts on things in order to get them done. And that really deeply resonated with me. I got to fully commit to something that I work on. I have this, mm -hmm. got to have this, I, within the game, I can mul be multifaceted. I think I do investigative reporting. I do uh, feature writing, yeah. interviews, uh, think pieces. That is fine. But... I'm at my best when, I, when I'm allowed to focus on a game. But that is not a good idea as a, as a content creator, eventually. At least you've got to be good at reading the, the crowd and see when it's time to jump off. I don't think that time has come yet for Overwatch, but it's at, the, at the same time, it's still... You've got to diversify, and yeah. I, I'm very bad at that. Okay. Uh, kind of speaking at that, one of the things you had mentioned before is kind of like, I, I, I kind of want to bring this up, is I, I kind of want to know what happened with Gothrag if you can go into it. Uh, mostly because I've had people who, obviously, I've had both Sir mm. Scoots and Alchemist on the show. Mm. Um, and that was one of the first, like, organizations that was really big and then got sold to, I believe it was, was it MLG who bought them? Yes. Okay, there we go. My history, I'm not very good at history, so. Mm. Um, and so they got about, like, what point do you get involved with Gothrag? So, Godfrey was honestly probably on its way out. Uh, I think it had been acquired uh, by MLG already. So, the draw was that my articles would then be promoted by MLG. Yeah. And 
I thought it would be to a way bigger extent than it actually was. I think two times it popped out on the stream during the weekend. But basically, I forget what his name was, but some guy who's like the editor-in-chief at that husk of what it was before. Yeah, because um, I killed it. Yeah. Contacted me and went like, okay, you're this WoW guy. It's our biggest game. Can you write for us? And at the time, I already have my own gig, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have my blog. I'm driving solid engagement every day. I think I had about 10,000 people re reading my article every single day. Like, and mm -hmm. then obviously more or less depending on the week. And for some reason, I was like, yeah, but it's probably like it's MLG. It's cool to work yeah. with them. Maybe people can see my stuff on the broadcast. And I put my reporting on, on my blog. Uh, on hold for that time and wrote for them and that was it was a nightmare so they wanted me to write entire recaps of every game if you know wow that is very hard to do um i and th then beforehand they s he said okay i cannot pay you which is fair enough that's esports yeah 2010 or whatever when it was and but he said i'll get you a a little th something, and if the pieces do well, we will fly you out for the next MLG. And so I write these pieces. I think in the three three days, I maybe sleep eight hours. The rest, I'm completely dedicating it, prepping, prepping storylines, writing feature articles in preparation for the stuff, writing these summaries, uh, these like little recaps and whatnot. I'm doing yeah. all of that that entire weekend. It's probably 60 hours of work. And I go to uh, 60, uh, probably 50. So um, I go to this guy and he says, whoa, the, the pieces are doing amazing numbers. It's all working very well. We'd love to have you back eventually. I'll also get you a little something. And he also, in the process, bungled several articles. I was stupid enough to not write it outside the editor. And he, mm -hmm. he would sometimes delete, and it didn't happen once, it happened three times, that he would delete articles, recap articles or whatever, that took hours to write several times. I was just like, oh my god, this is terrible. So, after the event, and he tells me the numbers are all amazing, I'm like, sweet, maybe I get a gig with MLG eventually. I'm getting my visa or my passport figure out and he completely goes after that like no no uh information whatsoever Just go. but eventually i i got to meet him at Seabit, and whew, i give that boy a couple of those opinions i had about this uh the way he acted right i got nothing out of it the hilarity honestly that makes it my one of my favorite stories of my esports career they had paid streams back then. Yeah. They tried that, right? So it was, I think, 280p, their normal stream, and then uh, the next best for the ones that paid. And I was like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing anything. So I paid the 10 bucks. I worked 50 hours over three days. I went out of that with minus $10, mate. <laughs> because I had to pay my own stream because they wouldn't even give me a code for that. So it, it was sad. a... It was a terrible experience for an outside. Actually, hilarious that it happened that way. Yeah. So you gave up. You were obviously you had this successful blog that was going on. You leave that to do MLG. Um, at some for point, the weekend, yeah. Uh, yeah. At some point, uh, like Blizzard kills their shit, like they they do with mm -hmm. like every game. Hashtag mm -hmm. here's the storms. Uh, hashtag more crap. Um, but this being said, one of the things that uh, happened uh, kind of with your blog that you you leave content creation is your best friend. He passes away. Mm -hmm. Right. That yeah. That's what happens. What was what was going through that? Like, because I can't imagine that there's anything like that. I just thought everything in the universe turned against me. My mm -hmm. game was it was in the beginning of Cataclysm. That was a terrible experience. I didn't even really have fun in a World of Warcraft anymore. Um, I, my, my friend passed, I, oh, beforehand, I tried to get my blog, like, we get this opportunity from Six Jacks, like, a supposed Fortune 500 company invests into this gaming website that has, like, a concept where 
we drive the traffic there and this website has like gaming uh methods so you can play so you buy tokens then you play invest them in this play and then you can buy like win an iphone or whatever Mm -hmm. right that thing completely knows dives we never get paid really um even the the biggest blog uh, in w- World of Warcraft at the time, cause, called Ming, World of Ming, goes belly yeah. up because of that, even though it had amazing traffic during yeah. that time. Crazy amounts of traffic that w- was driving uh, regularly. Mm-hmm. So all, like, my scene is dead. Uh, I just gave up law school for content creation. I di- uh, w- already did apply to... Or I think I was already in the first year of some university, so I was like, okay, that's it's time to grow up and do real life stuff, right? So mm-hmm. my my love for it's uh, probably not even true. Like I love writing certain pieces. Most of my writing, it most of the writing I have to do just commercially is actual torture to me. Like hate writing some of those stuff. And, um, yeah, basically I was like, okay, so we're doing that real life thing now. And then, uh, that honestly, I, I was still following esports, still watching League of Legends and certainly saw the rise of Twitch and, uh, played certain games always, but it really, really, I eventually just opened my Blizzard launcher and I think some friends, because a lot of, of the American players ended up at Blizzard. Yeah. Someone gives me an, a better invite. I still don't know who this guardian angel is that just gave me one. Or if I actually lucked the hell out as a European user to get a better invite. One of very, very few in the scene. But I'm like, I'm playing Overwatch and I'm thinking, wow, I really like this game. And then I just attach myself to that. Now we're here. Basically, so basically, that's it. That's it. So your your accident. When did that happen? Where you got hit by a car? Mm, I would say, how old was I? Twenty three, maybe twenty two, twenty four, something like this. And I'm I'm on my bike, mm-hmm. and I have like one in ear plug like this. I'm just driving and. Uh, where I live, there's like, there's an autobahn mm-hmm. uh, down, and then people can take an exit. And it, the problem is the exit doesn't look like it's not an autobahn. Mm-hmm. So there is a traffic light, but this, this kid didn't see it. He was like, younger than me. And they were, I remember it was, there's, a, there's an event hall very close here. And they were trying to go to a Rise Against concert. And... I drive, uh, I have green light and I'm on my bike and this, this guy, he bra- does brake, but, and I was able to jump off my bike, but I still was um, hit. hit and I wasn't terribly, I didn't think I was terribly hurt. Um, I got up, my bike was broken, uh, broken, like the front wheel was completely demolished. I just got up and I carried my bike off the road and this the guy turns in and is like, oh my god, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like looking down at myself. I'm bleeding a little bit on my uh, leg and my head hurts. I didn't have a, a helmet on and my Ooh. my head hit the ground pretty hard. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm I'm fine. And he he's like, I remember he took out his wallet and he just had a lot of money in there because he wanted to buy merch from from, yeah. right, uh, from the band and i they were probably 18 or whatever he was with his girlfriend and he's like oh yeah we we didn't know whether it was also, also pre-gps that yeah. was widespread right so he's like yeah we thought like we had to take a turn here but we didn't realize it was the motorway and i'm sorry i hit you should we call an ambulance i'm like no nah, i'm fine and He's like, oh, what can we do now? Should we call the police? And I'm like, honestly, <laughs> super naively saying, no, we don't need to. I would just like have some money to replace my front wheel. 
and he hands me 50 bucks, 50 euros. And I say, oh, that's too much. It's probably 30. And he gives me 30 and we go on our ways. Ended up being 60 bucks and all we're all to fix that bike. But I also had a severe concussion, which I didn't know at the time. Mm-hmm. So I get home, I'm throwing up immediately. Probably from the concussion, but also from the ad- adrenaline dropping. Yeah. Um, I call my mom, we go to the hospital. And in the aftermath, it's just like, I remember I stood up, I looked at this guy, and he was at the bus stop. And my reading of his face was disappointment. He looked at me as if to say, I would have really liked to see someone die today. I, I still look at this guy, go like, or maybe just like guilt, where he was like, wait, did you just drive over a red light? Which I didn't. Mm-hmm. And, but just to think, like, okay, so I, I'm sitting on my bike, and the front wheel gets hit, but I'm already almost standing up, but I get, like, just from my bike, it just get thrown across yeah. the street. It wasn't directly hit by the car. It wasn't like my, my head hit yeah. the roof, but my head dropped to the, to the ground, right? And I was like, okay, one meter m- more in front, and I'm done. I don't have a helmet yeah. on. This guy had way, uh, way more speed that, than you would normally have in that uh, area, residential area. I would have been gone. And just that thought, I think, then triggered just two or three years of nightmare pan- panic attacks where I couldn't handle it. I was, I was going to doctors. I was like, okay, I'm having these, uh, these problems. They have the concussion in mind. Nobody actually told me it could be a psychological issue. Or mm-hmm. Everyone tested for anatomic stuff, right? Like, okay, maybe there was a shift in your, uh, in your spine, or yeah. maybe there's an unrelated issue. I was diagno- tentatively like, diagnosed with um, multiple scler- sclerosis because of this oh. by an uh, orthopedist for a while. Which was hilarious. Like he just puts, gives me like this receipt, and on it is like differential uh, diagnosis, multiple sclerosis. Please go to a nor. Uh, what the fuck? Like, and my friend, who's a doctor now, goes, "Wait, he didn't write the code of it because you you don't want to freak out patients yeah. with with such a diagnosis." No, nope, he didn't care. This was the kind Jeez. of doctor that also doesn't give you the time of day. So. Nobody tells me that it could be a psychological issue. Even the guy, the uh, neurologist that is also a psychiatrist at the same time, just says, oh, you're probably having a little bit of uh, stress in university, which I didn't. I, yeah. Like, I had good, gr- good grades in university. Everything was going fine and dandy. Social life, definitely on the up and up. There was no reason for me to uh, mm-hmm. ha- be experiencing these things. Um, in the aftermath, like I, I didn't didn't tell them that I was hit by car, uh, but that I, that was a traumatic experience two years back, or yeah. that my friend that had happened to my friend and whatnot. And then eventually, it must have been a Reddit comment actually, where someone very, very detailed outlined what a panic attack looks like to him, and I was like, "That's me. That's what ha- what's happening to me." And then they recommended a book to me, uh, to, to just some random other person. It was called Your Nerves by, I, I could look it up, but um, I read through this book and I'm like, that's what I have. Why did nobody tell me this about two, two and a half years of meeting doctors pretty much every week? Nobody was able to tell me this. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I just, like, for people who have panic attacks, you know what this impulse feels. There's, there's certain triggers, right? For me, okay, so th- this is a popular thing now to say trigger or not. Yeah. not. Um, I cannot avoid my triggers. It's impossible. Unless I upload myself into a machine, I will yeah. always have these triggers, right? Yeah. Like just bodily sensations that I have, think I haven't felt before. Um, is, it just would put me in a spiral. This just ca- cascading thoughts of, Oh my God, this just happened. What could this be? Google. Okay. 
then my heart rate increases. Maybe I'll, I'll even have um, skipping. And it just keeps going worse and worse and worse. And then it tr- turns into a full-blown panic attack where I'm just like, okay, I'm dying, right? Like this absolute place of horror, right? Where usually you can have anxiety the entire day. And you're basically standing at the edge, looking down into the void. And you, you know very, you learn very precisely what the void is the longer you mm-hmm. have this. Sometimes I would get it when I'm driving over bridges, for instance. Or if I'm, if I'm, I have to be the driver for some reason. Yeah. Like if I'm being driven over a bridge, that's not a problem. And then I eventually learned through the topic that we described uh, earlier. That's not worth holding on to life with such a grasp that you're strangling yourself. Yeah. And just through that belief of just like, so I'm standing at this edge and I could fall down to this void. And maybe I do. But what is the worst thing that happened? Because it's my fundamental belief that every fear you have essentially comes down to your own survival. Yeah. Um, like, it's, it's just like a symptom of you feeling that your dis- that their continuous survival is harmed by whatever you're uh, afraid of, right? Now, if you just aren't afraid of death, that is, it doesn't matter really then, right? Yeah. Now, I'm of course not looking forward to it. I'm also certainly not, not, not scared, yeah. but I'm not terrified, mm-hmm. right? And that complete was a complete game changer. Now I still get impulses from time to time where I, th- where I think, <gasps> okay, uh, especially like, for instance, heart palpitations that happen sometimes are completely normal, theoretically. But there's this impulse that goes like, so, and you're like, okay, I'm in, at the edge again. But I'm not inching forward anymore because I know that my body's not giving me the, the right impulses that usually people have when they f- know something is wrong. Yeah. For me, everything could be wrong. So I'm not inching closer. I'm also, I, could, I can from a distance safely say, okay, if I keep thinking into that direction, I could absolutely cascade out of um, um, like sanity, control. almost. Yeah, yeah. And to have that is just. Um, I think honestly, that ability to just say, "Okay, I I got control of that, and I know how to control it." Man, it's it's liberating. It's really liberating. It's like I almost to the point where I say where it helps me so much in daily life, where I'm like. I'm not sure if I would avoid these years of nightmare in order to uh, learn this skill, right? And also just being put on this path of of self-discovery, not only that, but also spirituality has tremendously improved my life. And there's no way I end up in that place without those experiences. Mm -hmm. So in hindsight, honestly, Sure, someone could have handled my case better and just told me what the problem was a little bit earlier. But overall, having had it, I don't yeah. think it's a net negative at all. Mm-hmm. I, like that. I, I would agree with that. I think learning those skills are really, really important for like everyone, like really. Um, and I think that, like, especially like, coming from like a mental health background, like one of the things that we're taught, like when I was going to school, back when I wanted to be a therapist, uh, is that like, <laughs> I don't want to be a therapist anymore. Uh-huh. I don't like, no, no thank you. Um, uh, but back then it's like, like people can avoid triggers, but at the point where you avoid triggers, you become more afraid of the thing that you're avoiding. Yes. Um, and that's kind of like when we were talking about public speaking earlier, um, like I, I'd say that I'm fairly good now at public speaking. I like to, I like to, I actually enjoy going in front of crowds now, but like for most of my life until I was probably about like 23 or 24, I did not like him going in front of crowds and I played music in front of crowds. Um, I, I did other things. So like, it was just after a while putting myself through it, I was like, okay, I could be miserable or I could start to find some sort of enjoyment doing this now. So, but it, I think it's a good skill to learn. So we're on, I, I guess you're probably more on than me. Cause I, I'm not strictly overwatch. Um, cause I wanted to diversify mm-hmm. in other games. <laughs> yeah, was just than me, definitely. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I can't do fun content. I don't know. I don't know if this is fun content for me. It's fun content. Um, yeah. but you're stuck on kind of the overwatch train. Um, 
Does that terrify you? Because it terrifies me. Like, Overwatch as a concept terrifies me. Yeah. A little bit, yes. Um, part of my self-conception of what I do in this scene is trying to highlight issues. It, I mean, people can definitely say that's a selfish way of trying to police the situation, uh, the the scene, because mm -hmm. my ultimate attention uh, or intention is that we keep it around, but in a fair way. Yeah, I don't need. I'm not someone that needs to see it grow beyond. Like I'm much more into sustainability for the right reasons than growth for the wrong. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally. I'm not sure if that's true anymore, but I got into this. See, okay, from my standpoint, as we discussed, basically everything turns out to be a game. So yeah. no game is really more serious than the other game from, from yeah. that point, right? So um, I honestly also, just from my background in education, I honestly think that we don't give these idols enough credit for what they do for, to society. We're paying them a whole bunch of money, right? That, like these Michael Jordans and whatnot. Yeah. But still, that this is like people, children strive after them. Yeah. Right. To just say you could be the Michael Jordan of whatever you want to be mm -hmm. is a path forward. They don't understand initially that it's like a lot of, uh, of the children I teach come from um, either, either very privileged backgrounds and are also absolute, like, amazing at school, or they are from poor backgrounds. And then, especially the poor children, have this, okay, we, i got to make money. The reason I do things are making money. Yeah. Money, money, money. How much money is a pilot going to make? It's not, do I like being a pilot? It's, how much money does this make? How much money does this make? Yeah. And to sort of say, dude, you can just be excellent at just about every skill in life. And you're, if you're the absolute best in the world, you probably could be making a comfortable living at just about everything while yeah. also greatly enjoying yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I honestly think, for instance, let's, I, I went into this, I heard Overwatch League. Wow, okay. The way this was brought up was definitely like, if this works, it will influence society in the same way as sports does, which yeah. I personally think is very a very big impact on, on yeah. what uh, how society interacts and whatnot. So I want to be there for that. I yeah. love the game, and I also hope that this makes a cultural impact. But at the same time, I don't want to see it promote like values that then seeps into society that are not worth championing and where we're worth off for that. I honestly think some of the greedy aspects of esports have, could have, if, if it succeeds by those, terrible consequences on, on society at large. Mm -hmm. Now imagine, now of course, it's, it's far off to say that Overwatch will be, be this particular case. But what if Fortnite becomes something that rivals the NFL? Yeah. But we're not taking competition there seriously, right? We are, we're driving this by constantly inter innovating. All is fun. Ha, 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 ha. And um, we're not teaching. And then again, you can do it. Ha, 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 ha. That's also fine. That's also a fine skill to teach your children. But at the same time, you also got to teach them the gritty part of yeah. life. Wait, sometimes you just, you just got to have elbow grease and you just got to do it. And where, do, where else do they do, learn that? Where else ha, do they have role models yeah. of people just authentic too? I think it's, it's extraordinarily hard to create an artificial piece or potentially art that could inspire something authentically. It does happen in movies and, and TV shows, yeah. but these are master classes. It is vastly, it has more reach and it's vastly easier to have an absolute excellent individual stand in front of you, say, this is what I do in order to get here. This is me. And what I've learned is this. Mm -hmm. Right. And 
the selection not only of those individuals, but also to create a re environment where these people don't have to absolutely like destroy themselves in order to get there. Mm -hmm. Sports has a natural limitation, right? Yeah. When your body says no, then it's no. You can't push way p uh, harder than, like, especially NFL players, for instance, they go yeah. way past that. Yeah. Uh, Which is also why there's maximum the, practice hours implemented by their players' union. Exactly. That, nothing like this, no, no natural limitation yeah. exists in esports other than RSI or something. And even RSI, most players are uh, playing through with pain, mm -hmm. pain medication or whatnot. But the psychological elements, like, we don't have that baseline yet. We don't have an established understanding of human psychology where we say, oh, that's the baseline. This is basically a broken rib here. He cannot play anymore. Okay, so he's injured now, right? That is not our understanding of the current uh, yeah. situation. And the, the threat for esports players is so incredible. Like... The, the issues we have in Overwatch with that, and it's honestly like the system, how it facilitates that issue, and how it's getting worse next year. I'm scared. Yeah, I'm honestly I scared. I, I'm terrified. Yeah. I think we we. I, I honest, it's not. I'm like I'm wishing that. I'm not a vulture waiting for that story to pop. Yeah. But I think we will have severe cases of people breaking out. It is natural that in a population of like, okay, so you have players, staff, and whatnot. That's like 600 people in the Overwatch League that are commonly known. Yeah. It's natural that there will be some people that just by chance will have psychological issues. That's, yeah. Just, yeah. that's just a probability thing. It is happening way more than in the average population, though. Mm -hmm. There is something systematic to that circus that makes it problematic and the severity of these inflictions on psychology even though there's a very young players this will go bad and i, I don't want to even go where how much it can go bad mm -hmm. but we already have alcoholics in this we have people that have self-harm issues we have people that hoard in this uh we have people with chronic depression a lot of people that cannot take a step uh, uh, back because their team needs them mm -hmm. um, these issues are everywhere nobody's really talking about them I hope to be able to do that soon it's also hard to people to get people to open up to this particular yeah. problem now at least this year we had the mid-season break where it allowed teams to travel home and whatnot Next mm -hmm. year, teams will have two, two weeks of breaks. But for some players, that will still be a challenge to get uh, some off time. I, I was going to ask you, uh, and like not to delve too deep into this, but the midsummer break, because this is something that I, I like. I remember last year for Gladiators, um, like we had breaks. They were like 10 day breaks. Um, and I know that I like pushed really hard for Gladiators to have a, an extended break. Like, I was like, we need to have these days off. This is really important. It's not about the person who can handle it the most. It's about the person who can handle it the least. And you have to base yes. your entire team off your, your that, that doesn't mean they're weak or anything like that, but that's your no. least resistant person. And that's what you have to base it off of. Whether or not the other six players are good doesn't matter. Do you think that, do you think that teams actually took the break this year? Like from what you have been able to find, you don't have to go into specific details. Cause my opinion, and I'm completely outside right now is that mm -hmm. they didn't, is that they didn't the reason that I don't think that they did is because to the best of my understanding teams find it a competitive edge to practice more than other teams and I think this is true to a degree if you can out practice other people just like based on any sort of sports science people put in more hours tend to have uh, better results but the cost of that is you hurt people do you think that teams actually utilize that I think I think even most teams probably took some days off in the midseason I think mm -hmm. that happened and I think also a lot of the very successful teams are now wisening up to the fact that you need off days. And actually yeah. through that, they get better than they yeah. were before. Um, I do think that the problem is that they are the people that chase the top that are trying to push really, really, really hard and want to outwork the opponent. 
this is where the breaking points uh, yeah. occur, right? And where it's, it's honestly, it's not just the system that does it. Some of mm-hmm. these people also self-inflict. Oh, yeah, 100%. Potentially, potentially through a lack of education, strong drive. But if you could reasonably explain to them that their performance is not going to get better by this, and it might honestly all, all still be a lie. There might be definitely be players that need 14 hours yeah. of practice a day to be the best in the world. That's, that's a shitty thing that your body does to you, right? But mm-hmm. um, if, if they also have the psychology to back, back that up and that you could just do it, okay, right? But the, the evaluation of it is, um, is very important that their psychological uh, assists in some way that there's professionals, that there's also like just team managers that have a, a nose for this, yeah. that can uh, just see that this is a problem that might occur and just say, okay, we're taking a step back and also just incorporating sports into it more mm-hmm. to get some of that relief. I mean, th- these are not new ideas whatsoever. Yeah, no. my, my, like, certainly, like, the discussion also needs to be on the teams. Uh, in many ways, because they are the one that's pushing it. I was going to ask but, you: Do you think it's the responsibility of teams to solve this issue, or do you think it's Blizzard's responsibility? Because Blizzard's taken a lot of the responsibility, at least when it comes to contracts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think who's who's whose onus is it to to uptake this? Is it the so, players to fight for it? Is it the the teams to implement it because it's the best, or is it Blizzard because they're the overarching god of this game? Hmm. So my belief always is, is the guy that creates the system has the most responsibility. The politician has more responsibility or, uh, for the wealth of the country than I do as a person, right? Yeah. I can take responsibility for me uh, and the people around me, right? Mm-hmm. But there's no responsibility for me to, as a player from the Gladiators to make it so that the guy from Chengdu is, uh, yeah. is doing good, right? But they also have the most opportunity to make sure that they are healthy systems. Now, um, I understand the limitations that Blizzard has as a business. So, for instance, I don't think that is public knowledge, but the reason that the, the season is limited in the way that it is next year, that came up during the conference call, is because they need to figure out the, the visas before the season, so that's why it starts in February. They can't move it up to January because of that. And afterwards, their partners, their broadcasting partners, Disney and whatnot, mm-hmm. um, didn't want it to go longer. So they're confined to these time. Okay. Now, if you want to keep the same amount of games, that means you've got to have less same. breaks. Yeah. Now, it is, isn't... To be perfectly fair, it isn't less breaks than it is technically right now. Each team has eight to ten weeks of breaks. Now, I argue that uh, A, the traveling days uh, are also onto this. Like, mm-hmm. um, you got to travel and that falls into your breaks. Yeah. Then you could counter argue, okay, but you don't have Thursday. Thursday and Friday games anymore. You just have Sunday and Saturday games. So you got these two days you gain through travel. Um, at the same time, I think honestly, like having a long break makes it much more likely that teams are willing to give players time off. Because if you have four week a four week break, ten days at the start is much more manageable than saying, okay, we got one week off, we just lost that one game, we don't have time to reset. We, yeah. we got to catch up to these guys. Even if they do have two weeks, there's some travel in there. Practice environment is probably terrible in comparison to what you're used to now. And what do you mean time off? We just lost. Or even if, if they won, like, what do you mean? Like the, the other players, the teams aren't waiting for us. Yeah. So I think the, the order, the amount of breaks stays the same, but how it's partition and already i also have to say like that's not even these eight to ten weeks are not even sustainable already right so yeah ideally i would love to see the overwatch league just being extended and 
kept them the same amount of games and just more time off. I think it also would make for a better entertainment product because there's less fuel fatigue and there is um, better games because people have time to feasibly be human and play the game as well. You would have more fun interactions. The, the, some teams are understandably ridiculous with media. Yeah. Like, what do you mean 15-minute on interview? We don't have time for that. Probably don't have time for that, yeah. It's like in this very moment, like it's it's probably a pretty hard thing to uh, yeah, I, uh, I on the honestly, priority list. I can honestly say season one. I think we were very, like gladiators. Like I think they would do them like certain times. But basically, all the coaching staff and I think the players too were like, "No, nah, we did. We like we we don't have time. Like I wish we did." Um, and I would I would like make sure to go out of my way if someone ever asked me, just because I know how like I know how important the entertainment is for esports, and I think that a lot of players don't realize that or coaches is like the. The actual getting out there and people seeing your face is so important. Mm. Like, it's so important, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. I want to ask you a question about investigative journalism. Um, and this is going to be kind of a... I don't know if it's a good question or not, to be honest. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'm still going to ask it of you. Do you think that investigative journalism changes things related to esports? Do you think it actually has an effect? I'd like to think so, yes. Because there's certain information that the public is not uh, doesn't have access to mm-hmm. that allows companies to get away with stuff that they really shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not even that the companies are doing this willingly. Like yeah. Sometimes it's just not a highlighted issue. They don't think it's it's a problem for the public to for it to be this way. They just like. Some th- information is just contextualized differently in different yeah. circles. There's certainly also a bubble of understanding of these certain aspects. Um, I think the problem is the following, right? And I, I constantly have this moral dilemma where it's like, I don't, don't want to be an architect of morality in, in esports. I want to contribute to it, but by... S- Picking and choosing what kind of uh, investigative journalism or what kind of leaks I put out, I select for a different type of scene, right? Yeah. At the same time, it is absolutely vital that certain information doesn't go out because in all actual fact, it would only be negative to anyone that isn't my uh, boss, Mm. right? It would be bad for me because of how it would reflect with me with my sources it would be bad for potentially pla- okay let's take let's take um a leak on roster yeah. on a roster it has happened very often in the Overwatch League, much more than it should and i hope it, it also matures out of this because it does isn't a problem in professional sports most of the time where someone is very strongly considered by an organization is told you're getting your contract on Monday. He goes to his contenders team or whatever and goes, guys, I made it to Overwatch League. And yeah. one of those guys is either naive that this information is should not be up, went out mm-hmm. or is jealous of this and will share it with, with everyone. Or with mm-hmm. and eventually it lands on the investigative journalists. This is more of a problem in Overwatch. What will then happen is the investigative journalist says releases that information and the organization goes two things i guess three things can happen is the first thing is the play- players uh that it is interpreted that the player cannot keep a secret mm-hmm. right um they lose confidence in the player though that is by the way a terrible argument because you know how many hands this information has to go through just on like blizzard and yeah like the teams and whatever, there's so many leaking points that it's very hard to even pin on the player. Still happens, right? Still, they still make inferences where leaks are coming from. Um, and in, in general, then it, it hurts the player. Yeah. Um, it also provides the organization with feedback on what the community thinks of this signing. Now, in no way should it, a self-respecting organization consider 
evaluations of, of a community on the quality of player. That shouldn't ha happen. Wait, this guy's a trash can? Oh, I guess we didn't know that. Okay, we're not signing him. What you can consider is how a signing is received just like from a, from a PR point. Yeah. Right. Oh, this guy did this in the past and people are still feeling so strongly about this? Uh, better not sign him, right? And in this way, it can absolutely hurt uh, the chances of very deserving players to be signed on. Now, there's information that should be shared. And I honestly, sometimes I'm maybe being too much of an architect where I go, that is not an article I want to write. I'm going to the source of that and say, okay, guys, look at this. Um, this might be, become a problem eventually for you, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is then if I do that, very often people will not take that seriously yeah, and will not make changes based on that. And that is a reputational thing as well. Like I just, I just got to work into the no, like in, into a position where my opinion is considered and, um, wait. Like, that's all I can ask. But for the first couple of years, it was really hard to get people to agree to that and to eventually see it become an issue was very frustrating. So the next best thing then is to just release it and show them by proof of concept that this is actually something that people do strongly care about yeah. that they didn't know before. And I would generally say that I try to keep it fair. Like my, they, I think many people would even argue with me on the journalistic ethics. I, I might even violate a bunch of them. I would never feel good if I took a quote out of context yeah. and clickbaited that. I, you, every, every editor would tell you that once you are given the answers, you're this, like, as a self-respecting journalist, you are not to um, have the subject have any say in that. Yeah. I'm not doing that, but I'm definitely not choosing the, the, the one that I know will reflect badly on. Yeah. I will even sometimes go to the person and say, how do you feel about me using this headline? Now, this is a no-go for most editors. I personally weigh the utility of maintaining a solid connection to this very source that in the future will just give me a better story eventually. It's just some, sometimes it's just uh, being, in, being a solid human being and building connections through that and not trying to maximize my bottom line in every moment, in every piece that I'm writing, but thinking long term and trying to be symbiotic with the, with the scene, not a leech, yeah. right? And if, if I was ever required to do that, I think I would, I would immediately drop from that job. If I, if I felt that this is only serving my economic bottom line, I would, and my, my editors and my, my organization would uh, require that of me, I would drop that job probably immediately. Do you think that there's a place for journalism in esports? Because it seems like all of the, the companies that start up and kind of get rolling, they all fail, except for obviously ESPN has Disney backing. So like money, yeah. like they can, they can like throw money wherever they want and it doesn't matter. Uh, but like everywhere else, I question how long they're going to last. Because like we just see them start up and then they kind of drop out and then another one starts up and then they drop out. And it doesn't seem very sustainable. Yeah, the, the thing is, I think it's highly needed because journalism functions in esports almost like a police, right? Mm -hmm. That keeps things in order if done well. Problem is that it's very hard to monetize that way. I also, just through now having more access to metrics, I think you should pr write more pro uh, provocative headlines. You should mm -hmm. go into situations, you should write certain pieces that aren't hurting anyone, but are definitely a little bit more drama focused to help your company stay alive. So you can actually do the good work that is required. Unless you find a way to uh, do investigative journalism and then have a Patreon or something on the, uh, like it's gotta be sustainable. Like I, I, 
you most of the the people that do the important work it's not like they have a they're sitting on a pot of gold and yeah. can infinitely uh just do it for the good of from the good of the heart yeah. they gotta also make a living and i think journalism in general has a problem with that right and i think just it's also that uh, hobby journalists do a pretty good job honestly they are within uh within 20 percent of the performance that top journalists do but the problem is on the regular the problem is that hobby journalists get the crucial things wrong mm -hmm. like th that's that's one thing that i learned in recent years is like your average doesn't matter what matters is you gotta be right in the right moments and you cannot be wrong in the wrong moment so if i get a huge story on my uh, on my plate and I bungle that story then it's worse than when I had 20 stories and I just made a minor mistake yeah and it is worse for me it's worse for the entire ecosystem dude the way we process information as humans is fucking pitiful oh, it's, it's pretty bad. real bad it's like you can if you come out with a negative story about someone it is exponentially harder to get rid of that reputation there was a guy in germany who had this children's show and did like for i think 30 years and it was universally loved for it was like a little sciencey and like a little tinkerish engineering and whatnot so like bill and nye meets german pretty much yeah <laughs> okay and this this guy gave an interview to a to a newspaper and in it said he said uh he basically elaborated that there are moments where children can be terrible like they c just can be terrible to other children yeah. whatnot and he clearly contextualized this yeah but they took the quote out of context um children are little devils yeah or something like this and this reputation then then the yellow pages in germany picked it up you can ask nine out of ten germans uh in and ask him about that and the thing they know about him will be that even though he never meant this yeah and he went to his grave being universally hated even though he never had wow. the intention of uh that happening to him peter mm -hmm. lustig is uh, is his name for people who do, german people who don't know who i'm referring to it's a tragedy of a story and my God, are you an absolute wretch of a journalist if you wrote that article that initially, uh, like, frames him as someone who hates children when he his life work has been to educate and entertain children and raise them into adulthood, where he was universally liked uh, for what he did previously to that. What an absolute pathetic person you have to be in order to run that story obviously you had you had access it was a newspaper article a, an interview by another newspaper this guy read it took this quote out of context completely twisted the entire message and his reputation was tainted until he died dude what a what an absolute wretch yeah Be a really bad way to go yeah huh. So kind of looking at content creation, right? We've kind of like one of the things that I've noticed and you kind of touched on it a little bit is you need those like hot ticket headlines. Um, and I honestly, God, think this is like I'm getting better with it, but I'm like very like with my content, I'm being very slow at how I get there because I'm terrified of that. Like it scares mm. me more than anything else. Like, Understandable. Uh, like what I'm like, because obviously I do these really deep interviews and like the stuff I want people to care about, people don't care about until they, they get these other things that are like, oh my God, he said this, like uh, fraud said this about complexity that Jason Lake was drinking all the time and hit players, right? Like that's the thing. And then they watch the entire thing and they're like, holy shit, I didn't know anything about this person, uh, which is kind of like, but I'm like so scared about like putting those things out 
that I'm going to hurt someone's career. Like that is something that terrifies me, but mm. it feels like we're almost in a society, both like with like the, you like the way that the YouTube algorithm almost always works um, as well as like the, the stuff that is popular on social media, as well as Reddit. It feels like it's going very much towards sensationalism. And that's what you yes. need. If you, if you want your content there, you do need this form of sensationalism. Uh, yeah. Is that something that you're willing to do is that are you are you pushing yourself to get more like that so you can actually have a successful career and do these these uh uh investigative journalism that actually does have impact but you need some way to pay those bills for that mm. so i recently had a story that where i already felt a little bit uncomfortable in the way that i chose the headline the basic topic was that Shroud came into Overwatch, played it, and had a bunch of really... Like, if you play a game for the first time, you have terrible uh, opinions. Like, yeah. I remember picking up League of Legends and just thinking, saying to my friend, you're not playing Shogath, that guy is completely busted. Even though at the time he was like a mid-tier champion. Because I was yeah. just like, wait, you can one-shot me? That's stupid, right? Yeah. So you have stupid opinions, right? So I wrote this piece because I had knowledge of the just the waves that some of the statements he was making were running across other websites like it's crazy how well these these suggestions he was saying stuff like oh this game would be so good without ultimates that's the thing i focused on what he basically meant was i think though was this game would be better if it wasn't as much about ultimate and more yeah. about the fps aspect which makes sense he's an fps player and but he also said other statements like, "Oh, this game should have pick and ban, and uh, people shouldn't be able to switch characters." Yeah, um, which basically means you don't want Overwatch to be Overwatch. If we're being honest, yeah, right? yeah. So my headline and the writing was pretty. Comp I I like to think pretty compassionate of this situation. Like it's just a guy that plays a game for the first time. He has a certain inclination towards just wanting to out aim people. He's used to just. 1v3 through his superior mechanics. Yeah. And it doesn't work that's that well in Overwatch if you don't have the knowledge and also the, the strategical approach, right? Yeah. And I just said, oh, even all considering that, he could not know at this point. Like, and his opinions are being blown up, but they should not count for more than the average person. Yeah. That uh, picks up the game for the first time. Certainly has some, like, if he tells me, okay, this. This uh, gun, for instance, from Ash, is a little sloppy here in the way it aims or whatever. That I'm considering because this guy is a god at all those yeah. mechanics, right? Just overall game design, that's not, that's not his uh, expertise, right? He has no, yeah. um, no background in, in game design. He doesn't have the data to say what is fun for people as a whole and whatnot. So I just say, said, guys, that's just... A guy making a statement in the moment, don't take him seriously. And my headline was, uh, Shroud's opinions shouldn't be taken seriously. Now, the, the in instant connotation being that, uh, that most people took it that way is that Shroud is a clown in terms yeah. of what he does in Overwatch. I didn't mean that, though. What I meant is, literally, we, it's on us to contextualize that opinion and say, we cannot take that seriously until he has had more experience with the game, and then he ha can have uh, educated opinions about that. And it would be shocking if a guy could come in into Overwatch and through transcendent thought could immediately tell us, okay, A is wrong, B is wrong, C is wrong, and we have the best game in the world if we change that. Yeah, it would I mean, be absolutely... Can... Right? Insane. Yeah, so, I mean, he, he makes so much money consulting for Blizzard games, like, yes. we would have already had 2-2-2 two, two, two lock, probably. Yeah, probably. And I just said, okay, um, we as a community need to contextualize. Now, as a title, I was accused of clickbait, and it honestly probably was in the way mm -hmm. that it was perceived. I didn't initially think of it like you're in your mind and thinking, okay, Shroud should be taken seriously. It's nothing bad, but someone that hasn't gone through those thoughts, like he will think of it differently. So. Um, that article ended up making amazing numbers. It's, yeah. it's sad. It's sad. I can write intricate analysis pieces, feature articles that take 30 hours 
and I write one headline that is clickbaity, and they are doing five times the views. Yeah. It's a bug in the human code, as far as I mean. Concerned. That's I, I can say that's like for my deep time stuff, like the the, the stuff that uh, like everything that has been definitely more negative framing, um, and I don't feel bad for doing it because like like when someone like talks about it, they're like because I'm very clear about like what my show is, and like I, I, I feel mm. like I'm very understanding about what people want to talk about. I don't force people to talk about anything. Uh, it's very natural the way that like we come about things, and the, mm -hmm. they're okay. They they make a decision that it's okay to talk about this, and I. Do not take those clips out of context either. Uh, and so like a lot of times I'm like, if I can context this up in like what he is trying to say in these words, we're good. And so a couple of the ones that have been definitely more clickbaity, um, which have like had meaning behind them, they, they the, the metrics on them are significantly better than the time that like Nomi talks about the fact that his his mom got robbed and the effect that that had on him. Like no one, mm. like, no one cares. Like, everyone's like, oh, we, mm. don't, we don't care. But then we talk about the time that Swish is like, uh, yeah, Florida Mayhem was a complete wreck when I was there uh, and they didn't help me at all. And that thing just pops off and I'm like, like yeah. they're both important, but they're in my eyes equally important. Now, the trick is, and I think the problem is that it's arguably just as unethical. Uh, what also works is extreme posi positivity. Mm -hmm. And you get these stories that are extremely positive, and yeah. framing them that way is good. That's not a problem. Yeah. But exaggerating the positive impact of a story just to get those clicks, like, I think extreme positivity and negativity works. Yeah. Just negativity. There's more of a skill towards providing extreme positivity, right? Yeah. There are, for instance, YouTube channels that are hugely successful just on the base of philanthropy and yeah. just silliness at the moment, right? So that is, we're not completely screwed as a species that's that true. just like wants doom and gloom. It's also, we also want fairy tales sometimes, right? That's just fairy tales and doom and gloom. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it feels very extreme. I guess that's the thing is I don't like extreme at all. Like, I don't yeah. know. It's kind of an unfortunate thing. So to be honest, uh, like, believe it or not, this was all the questions I had for you. So we, we, I actually have one more. It's my last question I always ask everyone. Um, it's the only technically scripted question that I actually have. So um, even though I don't tell you that one either. Uh, so you've had the experience being on the show. Um, I hope it's been exciting. I've greatly enjoyed having your company on here. It's been a lot of fun. And I learned a lot about you, even though I actually know you, that mm -hmm. I didn't know before, which I always find quite fascinating and fun. Um, so having had the experience being on the show, if you could pick anyone to be on the show, um, the only caveats is that they have to be involved in esports in some aspect, and they have to speak English because I'm uncultured. Yeah. Who do you have on the show? I got to admit, I don't know if two of those have already been on, but I'm if just going to suggest. If you pick someone, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Okay. Bren. I've not had Bren yet. Okay, that's good. I think Bren would be excellent if he's willing to. Okay, I like that. Um, so I want to. This is your your time. If you want shout outs, you're more than welcome to have them. I don't normally give them because most of the time people don't watch them anyway, so it's like whatever. But if you want them, you're more than welcome to have them. No. Shout out to you for having me on. It was honestly a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate you being on the show. For everyone out there, it's been Deep Dives in the Minds of Esports. My name is Blake Panashevitz, and until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day.